joining us for tonight's lecture, Newport and its Cottages, Then and Now with Mike Franco. I'm Delaney Daly, the Development and Communications Associate for the Newport Historical Society. Before we begin, I'd like to remind everyone that NHS has a fantastic membership program. Your support allows us to offer programs like this. Members also receive subscriptions to our journal, Newport History, discounts at the museum and shop, and on walking tours and much more. Um, I'll share a link in the chat uh, later on for more information. Um, you can also email me at ddaily at newporthistory.org for more information. So tonight we're thrilled to host tonight's speaker, Mike Franco, who will survey 45 Newport homes featured by architect George Champlin Mason in his book, Newport and Its Cottages. In Mason's preface, he stated that his aim has been to bring together in a pleasing and attractive form illustrations of the beautiful country seats that adorn the southern shores of Rhode Island now so justly celebrated as a watering place. Tonight's presentation provided then and now look at each of the 45 properties. 26 of the homes still stand, although some are radically different. 19 have been lost to fire or intentional demolition and most are largely forgotten. Mike Franco is a trial lawyer with a practice in Massachusetts. He lives in a historic home in Newport and has a lifelong interest in Newport history and architecture. He moderates the popular Facebook group, Newport Lost and Found, which implores, explores Newport's Gilded Age architecture. And before we officially begin the presentation, I want to remind you to please type any questions into the chat. I'll share them with Mike during the Q&A portion when he has completed his presentation. And now I will turn things over to Mike. Delaney, it's, uh, it's a pleasure to be here with you tonight, speaking on a topic that I uh, have been interested in for a long time. Uh, Tonight's talk is going to blend Newport history with architecture and uh, George Champlin Mason, who's one of my favorite characters in Newport history. In 1875, George Champlin Mason wrote a book called Newport and Its Cottages. It's a photographic survey of 45 properties, groundbreaking in many ways. There'd been a number of books published with tourists in mind, which included engraved landmarks, but this was one of the first to include a catalog of actual photographs. In order to understand the book, you need to know a little about George Champlin Mason. Mason was born in Newport in 1820. This is a painting of a young Mason, probably in his 20s. That time period was a uh, transitional time in Newport history. In the 1830s, Newport was coming out of the depression brought on by the Revolutionary War. There wasn't much in the way of building activity. What we know as Bellevue Ave didn't exist and there was no Ocean Ave. But people began to slowly rediscover Newport as a summer resort. Folks from the South were coming to Newport to escape the oppressive heat of the summer and folks from New York were looking at Newport as an oasis from crowded conditions in the city. This led to a number of hotels being built, including Ocean House on Bellevue and Atlantic House on Pelham. This is an early photo of Ocean House on Bellevue. By the 1850s, Newport was back on the map. It was a place where people wanted to be. It was a place where people wanted to live, if only for the summer. This created a demand for something more substantial than hotels, created a, a, a demand for, for houses, uh, places where people could live during the summer or year round. And that's where George Champlin Mason fits in. Mason was a triple threat. He was an artist, a writer, an architect. In the 1840s, Mason spent time in Europe studying art. When Mason returned to Newport, he dabbled in landscape painting. This is an image of Rocky Farm overlooking Gooseberry Beach. It's painted by Mason in 1850 or so. It gives you a sense of the rural character of most of Newport at the time. This painting is hanging at the Redwood Library. If you haven't been there, you should definitely check it out. It's, a, it's an amazing place and it's, uh, it's an amazing painting. Unfortunately, the painting career didn't quite work out for Mason, so he went into writing and he became editor of the Newport Mercury. And that may be uh, where he did his most important work in Newport. He was head cheerleader for the effort to extend Bellevue Ave. He was also an early advocate for laying out Ocean Ave. In 1851, Mason wrote the following words. And while we're on the subject of drives and walks, we cannot ask better than to urge on all interested and who are not, the advantages to be derived from an open shore road around the whole southern portion of the island. 
Such a road is much wanted by all who love to stroll near the seashore. If opened, it would immediately become a fashionable drive of an afternoon. How's that for being a visionary? This is an early image of what eventually became Ocean Ave. This is the gooseneck area. In 1858, Mason left the Newport Mercury. He took his art background, his knowledge of Newport real estate, and his local connections, and he began his career as a professional architect. Over the next 35 years, Mason and his firm worked on 150 or so projects in the Newport area. Many of the projects involved his son, George Champlin Mason Jr., who joined the firm in 1867. This is Mason in his older years. He passed away in 1894 and he's buried in Island Cemetery, but Mason left us with a remarkable body of work, including his book, Newport and its Cottages. Mason covered 45 properties in the book at least 17 of the houses were designed by Mason's firm, but it wasn't simply a marketing effort for his office. He included houses by many of the leading architects of the time, Richard Upjohn, Richard Morris Hunt, Peabody and Stearns, they're all here. Of the 45 properties, 26 still stand, 19 have been lost, either to fire or intentional demolition. We'll cover all 45 properties tonight. It's uh, an awful uh, to review, but uh, I think we can do it. We've got a lot of ground to cover. So without further ado, I give you Seaview. Seaview was built in the 1860s. By the time of Mason's book in 1875, it was owned by James Knochen and his wife, Catherine Lorillard of the Tobacco Lorillards. It was located on Ruggles. Mason designed the original house, which saw a number of alterations over time. Here's the next version. It's the same core structure, but a tower has been added. I'm not sure who the architect was, but I suspect it was Mason's firm. There are similarities to Hartsey's, which we'll discuss in a bit. And here's the next version. Uh, this version was, uh, was done by Newport builder and architect J.D. Johnston in the late 1880s. He took the house and wrapped it in a Tudor exterior. You see some of the original Mason uh, design there, but uh, uh, at that point, the building was beginning to see a, uh, a real transformation. And if you think this is dramatic, you ain't seen nothing yet, because this is what came next. In 1922, the Kenochin family sold the property to Edson Bradley. He commissioned Horace Greenlee to transform the house into what we recognize today. This is Seaview Terrace. The next property is By the Sea. By the Sea was built in 1860 for August Belmont and his wife, Carolyn Perry. Carolyn was the daughter of local boy, Commodore Matthew Perry. This is Carolyn in a carriage by the sea. The house was located on the corner of Bellevue and Ruggles. Mason designed the house. It remained in the Belmont family until the 1940s. This is an 1890s photo. The house then passed to a number of different owners. It was eventually purchased in 1945 by the Van Cleef family. They owned Rose Cliff at the time. The Van Cleef family demolished by the sea to add acreage to Rose Cliff. Rose Cliff was later purchased by the Monroe family. And in 1971, the Monroe family donated Rose Cliff to the Preservation Society. They subdivided the land once occupied by by the sea and new homes were constructed. The most recognizable on the, uh, in that area today is probably Parterre. The next property is Ferncliff. Ferncliff was built in the early 1850s for Francis Stout. It was located on Bellevue. I haven't been able to identify the architect. After Stout's death in the 1890s, his family sold Ferncliff to Alva Vanderbilt. She demolished Ferncliff and hired Richard Morris Hunt to build her a new house. And of course, what followed was Marble House. The next property is Fairlawn. Fairlawn was built in the early 1850s by Newport builder and architect, Seth Bradford. Bradford had just completed work on Chateau sur Mer. The original design was very different from what exists today. There were two gables rather than the current three. At the time of Mason's book in 1875, the house was owned by Levi Morton. He would serve as governor of New York and the vice president under Harrison. Uh, if you're from the Newport area, you may be familiar with Morton Park. Uh, the land where Morton Park is located was donated by 
Levi Morton. Morton commissioned a series of extensive renovations by some pretty big deal architects, Richard Morris Hunt, then McKim Eden White, then Peabody and Stearns. This is how the house looked in the 1890s. You, you see a stir in the transformation. Uh, at that point, there were still the, the two gables. The house then passed through a number of different hands until it was acquired by Sal Regina in 1997. And this is Fairlawn today, occupied by the Pell Center. The next property is the Frederick Sheldon House. This house was designed by George Champlin Mason Jr. in the early 1870s for the Sheldon family. It stood at the corner of Annandale and Narragansett. At some point, it was assimilated into the grounds of the orchard, which we'll discuss in a bit. It was demolished after World War II by the owner of the orchard. In recent years, the original lot has been subdivided from the orchard, so the lot is uh, somewhat more similar to uh, the way it was configured back in the 1800s. There is a newly constructed house on the spot, which is appropriately now named Little Orchard. The next property is the Henry Taylor House. There's not much that's known about it. Not much has been written. It was built by Taylor on Bellevue sometime before 1875. I haven't been able to identify the architect, though it looks like a Mason design. It was sold to Elisha Dyer in the early 1890s. Dyer demolished the house and hired J.D. Johnston to build the present colonial revival version. This is a photo of Johnston's work. You'll recognize it as Wayside. Wayside still exists as a bed and breakfast. The next property is Bienvenue. Bienvenue was built in the early 1850s with Joseph Hart. It's believed that the architect was Joseph Wells because of its similarity to Seacliff, which we'll discuss in a bit. Time of Mason's book in 1875, the house was owned by E.D. Morgan, who had been governor of New York. The house is probably best known as the home of Richard Wilson. He was the father of the Marion Wilsons, his daughter Mary, married Ogden Golette, his daughter Grace, married Cornelius Vanderbilt III, and his son Marshall married Carrie Astor. This is the property today. It's been converted to condos and it's kept in immaculate condition. Looks uh, very much like the original house. The next property is the orchard. The orchard was built in 1873 for George Fearing. It's located on Narragansett Ave. Fearing hired a French architect to make drawings of a typically French chateau. He gave the drawings to Mason to implement the design and that's what we see here. The house hasn't changed much in 150 years. It's still a single family home and uh, I, I think it's probably one of the most beautiful approaches of any house in Newport. The next property is the Catherine Lorillard Wolf House. And no, I'm not talking about Vinland. This was her house on Toro Park. It was designed by Mason in the 1860s for Daniel Edgar. In 1872, Edgar sold the house to Wolf of the Tobacco Lorlards. Wolf summered in the house until building Vinland in 1882. Vinland was decorated with a Viking theme. So you have to wonder whether Wolf was inspired by the Viking stories uh, surrounding the stone tower in Turo Park. This photo provides a bird's eye view of the wolf, wolf house and its surroundings. It's probably taken from the steeple of Channing Church. You can see the wolf house in the fore, foreground and there's a couple of other buildings that uh, you may recognize, including the original Rogers High School, which was incidentally designed by Mason. The house has seen a number of renovations over time. This is a turn of the century photo with either a ballroom or a sunroom to the left, I'm not sure which. Uh, there was also a major renovation in the 1940s. The house went from Italian to federal. This is the way it looks today, quite the transformation. It is still a single family home. The next property is the Edward King House. This is one that most of Newport is familiar with. It stands on a hilltop overlooking Spring Street. It's designed by New York architect Richard Upjohn in the 1840s in an Italian villa style. Upjohn worked on the house soon after completing what's now called Kingscope. The house was originally owned by Edward King, 
who made his fortune in the China trade, known property all over Newport. This is a photo of the King family in 1873. Fellow in the center with the distinguished mustache is Edward King. The house was donated by the King family to the city of Newport in 1912 for use as a public library. This is a photo of its time as the library. If you look closely, you'll see the sign above the door, which I love. It says the People's Library. The house presently serves as the senior center. Again, just remarkably preserved. Looks the same today as it did back in uh, Richard Upjohn's time. The next property is Hearts Ease. This house was built for CN Beach in 1873-1874. It's located on A Street. It was designed by Mason in a second empire style. Mason Jr. did a renovation about 10 years later. He added a part cochere and some colonial revival details. There's a photograph uh, taken in 1914. It shows some of the changes, uh, including the port cochere. The house does remain intact, albeit with a poorly thought out addition from the 1970s, which replaced the port cochere. The house has been converted to condos. Uh, I took this photo a couple of months ago. I couldn't bring myself to photographing the addition, um, but uh, this provides you with a, a sense of uh, what the house would have looked like uh, back uh, when Mason Jr. completed his work. The next property is Chateau sur Mer. Chateau sur Mer was designed by Seth Bradford in the early 1850s. It was originally owned by William Shepard Wetmore, but it's perhaps more associated with his son, George Peabody Whitmore, who was governor of Rhode Island. George inherited the property and he hired Richard Morris Hunt to renovate the house in two phases. In order to understand the changes, we need to step back to the original version of the house. And that's what we see here. This photo was taken sometime before 1870. It so shows the house as originally built. This is Seth Bradford's vision for Chateau Sermer. The first phase of renovation took place between 1870 and 1873. Hunt raised the roof and he re rebuilt it in a mansard style. He created a new entrance with a port cochere and he added a new tower. That's the condition depicted in Mason's 1875 book and that's how the main approach looks today. The second phase took place between 1876 and 1880. Hunt raised the dining room and service wings by an additional story on the northeast side. You can see the changes in this late 1870s photo as compared to the current photo. The house was owned by the Wetmore family until the late 1960s. It was then sold to the Preservation Society. The next property is Oaklawn. Oaklawn was designed by Richard Upjohn in the early 1850s. It once stood on Narragansett Ave. Initially owned by Charles Russell, Russell's family sold it to James Stoneman, who expanded the house and added a tower. This is the renovated version. Stoneman sold the house to William Fanestock in 1922. Fanestock demolished Oaklawn and replaced it with something very different. He hired Charles Adam Platt to build Bois Doré, which still stands today. If you'd like a sense of what Oakland looked like, you should check out Cloverly on the corner of Catherine and Greeno. Cloverly was designed by Mason in 1863, 10 years after Oakland was built. I assume that Mason was influenced by Upjohn's work, especially since Mason included Oakland in his uh, 1875 book. This is Oakland on the left and Cloverly on the right. Cloverly is basically Oaklawn, but with a mansard roof. Very similar look, so I believe there's a connection there. The next property is the Thomas Cushing House. This house has gone by many different names. It's had many different looks. It started its life as New Lodge, a stick style house designed by George Champlin Mason Jr. in 1869 for Cushing. This may have been Mason Jr.'s first project. He was 20 years old. Cushing family owned the property until 1916 when it was sold to the Ames family. Ames family renovated the property in a classical revival style, essentially wiping out the original stick style design. I've seen some references to Mason Jr. as the architect for the renovation, but I haven't been able to confirm this. It was renamed the Ames Villa. Here's an aerial photo of the renovated version. 
The Ames family sold it to Mrs. J.P. Donahue, an heiress from the Woolworth fortune. In 1945, she uh, renamed it Rockcliffe. Its next owner, and perhaps its most uh, famous owner, was Harold S. Vanderbilt, the son of William and Alva. He and his wife, Gertrude, owned Rockcliffe from 1961 until the late 1970s. Here is Harold in front of Rockcliffe. The house still stands as a single family home between Ocean View and Rough Point. You can see Rough Point in the background. This photo was taken in the early 1960s. The next property is the Frederick Stevens House. You may recognize it as Elm Court on Bellevue Ave. It's an Italian house built in 1853 for Andrew Robeson Jr. It was originally called the Cedars. I don't know if an architect was involved. It may have been designed by Robeson himself. Robeson was uh, one of the founders of the Newport Reading Room. His father owned a beautiful federal style mansion in New Bedford. I know it well because that's where my office is located and that's actually where I'm sitting right now. At the time of Mason's book in 1875, the house was owned by Frederick Stevens. I've read that Mason did some renovation work at Elm Court. They haven't been able to confirm that. Uh, I do know that there were later embellishments by Stanford White and Ogden Codman. This is the house in 1914. Not a lot of change. The house has been uh, well preserved over the years. The house was eventually sold to the Carey family, and I understand that the Carey family still live there. Here we have Elm Court today. Uh, if Robeson were to uh, go up those front stairs and enter the house, he would pretty much know exactly where he was going. It hasn't changed much. Looks the same today as it did back in the 1850s. The next property is the lodge. I don't have any photos of the original house. This is uh, a renovation. The renovation took place in 1869, 1870 by Richard Morris Hunt for William Coles. The lodge was located on Bellevue Ave between Narragansett and Dixon. Hunt worked in the stick style in many of his early commissions before diving into the Beaux-Arts style that he's best known for. And this is a fine example. Uh, we, we see Richard Morris Hunt uh, dealing with stick style in such homes as the Griswold House, which we won't be talking uh, about tonight, but uh, there are many uh, examples of this early Hunt work to be found around Newport. Here's a couple of additional views of the house. The lodge was demolished around 1900 to make way for Ogden Cogman's masterpiece, Villa Rosa. I guess if you're going to demolish a house by Richard Morris Hunt, you better have something special in mind. Ironically, Villa Rosa was demolished in 1962. I guess the wrecking ball giveth and the wrecking ball taketh away. This is the aftermath. The next property is the home of Mrs. Colford Jones. This house was designed by Mason for Mrs. Jones at some point before 1875. It was located next to the lodge, and like the lodge, it was displaced by Villa Rosa around 1900. But the house wasn't demolished. Instead, it was moved to Narragansett Ave. Uh, unfortunately, it's lost most of its decorative elements, but the core is still there. The house has been converted to condos. The next property is the Loring Andrews House. This property has been on a fun ride. It began its life as a, a very flamboyant stick style house designed by Mason in 1871, 1872 for Loring Andrews. Here's another view of the house. It was uh, sold to Theodore Havemeyer in 1880. Uh, Havemeyer toned it down a bit. He renamed the property Friedheim. He hired the Mason firm in 1888 to do a major redo. This is the, the next iteration of the house. The house was later sold to Pembroke Jones in 1903. Jones renamed it Sherwood, and he hired Francis Hoppin in 1906, 1908 to do another major redo. And here we have what uh, presently exists. And as you can see, it's been uh, a, a serious transformation over uh, many years. The original design by Mason wasn't well received by many. Town and country called it, quote unquote, one of the most unsightly houses in Newport. Mason used his book to respond to the critics. He wrote, the house has been criticized on the one hand 
and equally admired on the other, as will always be the case with any wide departure from old rules and form, forms of construction. Had it been placed farther back from Bellevue, it would have given the eye a better opportunity to take in its vast proportions and towering height. But whatever objection may be offered to its dimensions, one cannot but admire its skyline on the long side as it rises gracefully on either hand to the apex in the play of light and shade that follows the varied form of structure. How's that for some literary flourish to a little of Mason the writer at work? But in the end, the critics had the last laugh. There really isn't much left from the original design. The house has been converted to condos. Uh, it uh, provides a very nice example of Hoppin's work. Uh, with that said, the 1870s carriage house, this is uh, a part of Mason's original work. Uh, this still exists and this is on Cogsell. The next property is Ochre Point. And this may get a bit confusing. There's an Ochre Point that's built by, that was built by McKimmead and White in the 1880s. This isn't that Ochre Point. This house was built in the 1830s for William Beach Lawrence. Lawrence was a diplomat living in New York City. He knew that his young tailor, Alfred Smith, was originally from Middletown. And so he solicited Smith's advice on where to purchase property. Smith recommended Ochre Point Farm. And based on that advice, Lawrence purchased 60 acres for $12,000. He then built this fairly modest house called Ochre Point. It was later renovated by Richard Morris Hunt circa 1860. 1861. It was Hunt's first commission in Newport. So this is pretty much where it all began for Hunt. After Lawrence died, the property was subdivided. Portions were sold to the Van Allen family and the Lorillard family. Here's an aerial view of where Ochre Point was located. The house was demolished to make way for Wakehurst and Vinland. And this is Vinland. This is the house built by Catherine Lorillard Wolf in 1882. By the way, Alfred Smith is the uh, fellow who spearheaded the effort to extend Bellevue Ave at uh, Taylor in New York. Uh, he may be the most important, least recognized person in Newport history, but that's a story for another day. The next property is the Winans House. This house was located on Ocean Ave near Castle Hill. It's perhaps better known as the original Bleak House. It was built in 1864 in a Second Empire style for Thomas Winans. Winans may have designed it himself. I hate to go down a rabbit hole, but I do wonder if Winans was influenced by the house that Richard Morris Hunt built for Arthur Bronson in 1860, 1861. That's the house in the upper left. You see a similar design in 1869 with the train villa. That's the house in the upper right. Sadly, all three houses are gone. The Bronson House was demolished in the 1890s and replaced by Shamrock Cliff. The train villa was destroyed by fire in the 1970s. And the first Bleak House was demolished in the 1890s to make way for a second Bleak House, an impressive shingle style house built by Peabody and Stearns in 1895. This is the second Bleak House. The next set of photos appears to capture a time when both the first Bleak House and the second Bleak House stood together on the property. This would place the photos in the mid 1890s. The second Bleak House was heavily damaged in the hurricane of 1938 and it was later demolished. The lot is now open space. Uh, if you've been to Castle Hill, you'll recognize the spot. It, uh, it remains vacant. It's a uh, part of the Brenton Point Park, I believe. But some of the second Bleak House still lives. In 1948, its stonework was salvaged by Trappist monks who built a monastery in Spencer, Mass. And this photo shows where the second Bleak House was resurrected. You really can't make this stuff up. The next property is Beach Cliff. Beach Cliff was located on Bath Road, which is now Memorial Drive. It was built for Delancey Kane by New York architect Detlef Bienal in 1852. It was a later edition of a gatehouse by Seth Bradford. At the time of Mason's book in 1875, it was owned by C.J. Peterson and it was called Red Cross. In the 1890s, the property was sold to Richard Madison who made his fortune in the asbestos business. Madison hired 
J.D. Johnston to build a carriage house stable. Here's an early photo of the carriage house stable. Uh, and this photo was actually used in ads for asbestos products. I think that was probably a function of the asbestos shingles on the exterior. Madison then renamed the property Bushy Park. It all lasted until 1939 when Beechcliff was demolished to make way for a residential subdivision. The gatehouse and carriage house still remain, which provide a glimpse of what must have been an incredible estate. Here's the carriage house. I believe it's apartments now. And here's the gatehouse, which I believe is a single family home. The next property is Fairborn. You may recognize it better as Quattrell on Bellevue across from Rough Point. It was designed by the Providence architect Thomas Teft for Earl Mason in 1853. Here is Teft's original drawing, shows an Italian villa. What exists today is very different. Second, Second Empire house with a mansard roof. It's unclear whether the Italian version was ever constructed. We know that uh, by the time Mason published his photo of Quattrell in 1875, the house looked nothing like Tuff's original drawing. In 1880, the house was sold to Edgerton Winthrop. He engaged Newport architect Dudley Newton and designer Ogden Codman to renovate it into what exists today. The house was eventually sold to Louis Lorillard. He renamed it Quattrell with a four L's in his name. Quattrell is still a single family home. And if you're in the market, it is presently for sale for 7.25 million. The next property is the John Foster House. This house was built on Leroy Ave sometime before 1875. The design of Second Empire, the architect is unknown, though the porches suggest Mason's hand. In 1898, it was replaced by a beautiful colonial revival house by Peabody and Stearns to John's daughter, Fanny. Fanny's house survives today as Ridgemere. I initially assumed that the John Foster house was demolished, but like many old houses in Newport, it was moved a few blocks north to Perry, Perry Ave. It survives today as a condo building. It does look very different without the majestic porches, which uh, were probably removed because of the configuration on the lot. Not an awful lot of frontage uh, at this particular location. The next property is Ocean Lawn. And this isn't the ocean lawn that exists today. This is the original ocean lawn at the end of Narragansett Ave. Not much I know, uh, the rest is a puzzle. Uh, I do like puzzles, but uh, this one has been uh, uh, a challenge. The house is identified as being built for Robert Ives and Mason's book, which dates before 1875. The architect is unknown, though it looks like Mason or Richard Upjohn. It appears that at some point the house was transferred to Iris Gamel. Then after 1875, there were substantial renovations to the house. And this is where it gets fuzzy. The Ives Gamel family owned most of the property in that neighborhood. At some point, the house and a substantial parcel of land were transferred to Mrs. William Gamel. I suspect that when Mrs. Gamel hired Peabody and Stearns to build her grand new house in 1888 at the end of Cliff Ave, she took the name Ocean Lawn for the new house. And the old Ocean Lawn became known as South Cottage since it was south of the new Ocean Lawn. And what we're looking at is South Cottage. In the 1950s, when the Firestone family owned Ocean Lawn and South Cottage, they had South Cottage demolished to make room for a, believe it or not, pool house. Go figure. Uh, this is an aerial view uh, taken recently, which shows the current Ocean Lawn South Cottage would have been to the left of this, uh, of this photo, but this provides you with a sense of the overall surroundings. The next property is Villa Lou. Villa Lou is actually just over the Newport border in Middletown. It was built in 1857 by Richard Upjohn for Alexander Van Rensselaer. There's some indication of a renovation by Richard Morris Hunt in 1867, 1868. In the early 1900s, the property was sold to Adolf Audrain of uh, the Audrain building, who did uh, some further renovation work. He rena renamed the property Restmere. And here it is today, still exists as a single family home. It's been uh, well loved and well cared for. Uh, 
But uh, you can't mention Villaloo without mentioning its sister house, Villa Lawn. Villa Lawn was built by Upjohn in 1856 for Hamilton Hoppin. One sister owned Villa Lou, while the other owned Villa Lawn. Believe it or not, these are photos of two different houses. You have Villa Lou to the left and Villa Lawn to the right. The next property is the De Hauteville House. This property is still located on Bellevue between Garden and Victoria. If you don't recognize it, there's a good reason. It was designed by Peabody and Stearns for Frederick de Hauteville in 1871. The design is a, an ornate stick style. Here's another view of the house. It survived intact into the 1950s, but after a fire, much of it was demolished. The final photo depicts what's left today. The third floor and all of the ornamentation are, are gone, but it does still exist as a single family home. The next property is Gravel Court. Gravel Court was designed by Mason in 1860, 1861 for George Tiffany. The house still stands on the corner of Merritt, Ansett and Clay. It's very well preserved, but it looks like the entry has been enclosed and the balcony is gone. Uh, otherwise the house looks pretty much as it was designed by Mason. The next property is Lindengate. Of all the houses lost in Newport, this one probably pains me the most. This was a stick style house by Richard Morris Hunt. Hunt designed Linden Gate in 1873, Henry Marquand, corner of Rhode Island Ave and Catherine Street. The level of detail is, is breathtaking. You could spend hours looking at this image. Here's a couple of additional views from the 1890s. Again, you see just a crazy blend of brackets and balconies and um, just a very creative design. Linden Gate was uh, regrettably lost to fire in 1973, but the carriage house stable still exists. This is how it originally looked. And this is how it looks today. Stable was relocated on the property and it's been converted to condos. The Porter's Lodge for Linden Gate also survives. This is on Gibbs. The next property is the Moses Lazarus House which is also known as Beaches. Beaches was built for Lazarus by Mason in 1870. It stands remarkably intact at the end of Bellevue. The house is perhaps best known as the home of Emma Lazarus, who penned the poem, The New Colossus on the base of the Statue of Liberty. You know the one I'm talking about. Give me your tired, your poor, your huddled masses yearning to breathe free. That was Emma and it's still a single family home. The next property is Edgewater. Some folks love it, some hate it. I fall into the love it category, designed by Mason in 1869, 1870, by J. Frederick Pinochin. He was brother-in-law to Catherine Lorillard Pinochin from Seaview. This is a view of Edgewater from the cliff walk. We have from left to right, the original breakers, we have Cave Cliff, and uh, to the far right, we have Edgewater. Edgewater lasted about 20 years before being demolished and replaced by something a bit more grand. And we know it all as uh, Court. The next property is the Grotto. And this one's gonna blow your mind. Do you ever wonder what house was replaced by Rough Point? Well, here it is. Grotto was built in 1869 by Mason in a second empire style. William Tucker. The grotto had an illustrious life. It was located at the end of Bellevue overlooking the chasm at what's now Rough Point. It was rented by Cornelius Vanderbilt II from 1881 until he purchased the original version of the Breakers from the Lorillard family. The house was then purchased by Frederick Vanderbilt who began working on building Rough Point in 1888. But uh, fortunately that wasn't the end for the grotto. Frederick had the grotto moved to a site north on Bellevue where it was renovated by J.D. Johnston. It was then owned by the Post family who renamed it Rosetta Villa. This photo shows the house in its new location. But uh, unfortunately, um, uh, the, the house came to uh, an end after all of that uh, uh, time and effort in terms of relocating, re relocating it. The house was demolished in 1938. 
the lot sat vacant for several years. It's now occupied by a French chateau inspired house. The next property is Beaulieu. This house is perhaps best known for who owned it. It was built in 1859 by Albert Calvert Vox for Federico Bereda. There are photos taken from the tower of Beaulieu in the 1860s. This is the first, this one's looking uh, west towards uh, Bellevue Ave. The photographer would have been in the tower. This is a second photograph taken at the same time. And here we have the photographer looking north from the tower uh, again towards Bellevue. They do give you uh, a sense of how open uh, that part of Newport was and how undeveloped uh, Bellevue was even as late as the 1860s. In 1875, Bereda sold the house to William Blodgett, who died the following year. He's the fellow identified in Mason's 1875 book. The house was eventually sold to John Jacob Astor in 1879. Astor gave it the name Beaulieu, which is French for beautiful place. The house remained in the Astor family until the early 1900s. In 1901, Cornelius Vanderbilt III took a long-term rental on the house and he eventually purchased it. His wife, Grace, made some substantial alterations. This is a 1947 photo, which shows some of the changes made by Grace. As you can see, there were modif serious modifications to the tower. In the early 1960s, Wiley and Ruth Buchanan purchased the house and made additional alterations. And here at the bottom, we see Beaulieu as it uh, appears today. And uh, this slide presents the, the many faces of Beaulieu over time. The property is still a single family home. The next property is the Parent Stevens house. This house was designed for Stevens by New York architect, George Platt in 1865. It sat on Bellevue Ave to the rear of Stone Villa. Stone Villa was best known as the home of James Gordon Bennett. The Stevens house was demolished in 1925 and the land was added to Stone Villa. This is Stone Villa as it appeared at the turn of the century. But like I said, the wrecking ball giveth and the wrecking ball taketh away. Stone Villa was demolished in 1957 and the property is now a shopping plaza. The next property is the R.H. McCurdy House, which is also known as Ocean Manor. Ocean Manor sits at the top of Shastlix Ave. It was built in 1858-1859 by Mason for Dr. David King. This was one of Mason's first projects as a professional architect. Dr. King lived at what's now the Muchinger King House on Bellevue Ave. He owned Ocean Manor for a short time. He sold it to Robert McCurdy in 1866. So I suspect that Dr. King viewed the property as an investment. Here's an another view of Ocean Manor. A uh, bit of trivia, Eleanor Roosevelt had her coming out as a debutante at Ocean Manor. The house still stands as a condo building, but it's lost much of its original character. The next property is Cliff Lawn. This one should be familiar to you. Cliff Lawn was built in 1870, 1873 for J. Winthrop Chandler by Mason. It's led many lives as a home, as a school for girls, as a boarding house, as a museum, and as a hotel. Thankfully, it survived a major fire in 1944. Here's a photo of the fire. Many in Newport will remember it as Cliff Walk Manor. Today, it's a hotel called The Chandler. The next property is the Nathan Matthews House, which was also known as McCurdy Hall. Matthews House was built in a stick style by Peabody and Stearns in 1871. Here's another view of it. Mason included a number of stick style houses in his 1875 book. It was a fashionable design in, in the 1870s, but it eventually fell out of favor, which is one reason why so many were demolished. Stick style houses also used balloon framing, which made them vulnerable to fire. The Matthews house is exhibit A. The house was damaged by fire on New Year's Eve in 1881. The lot sat vacant for nearly 20 years. It was eventually purchased by Anna Gimbrell who hired Career and Hastings to build Vernon Court. The next property is Seacliff. This house was built by Joseph Wells on Bellevue in the early 1850s. It was originally called The Reefs. By the time of Mason's book in 1875, it was owned by John Noer. He renamed it Seacliff. 
Its most famous occupants were Harry Payne Whitney and Gertrude Vanderbilt. This is a photo of the house as the Whitney Cottage. The house was damaged by fire in 1942 and it was eventually demolished. Here is the aftermath of the fire. In 1953, Reginald Reeves hired Frederick Weinlander King to build a brick, brick colonial revival house in its place, which he appropriately named Seacliff. And here is the new Seacliff. There are a couple of remnants of the original property. This is the gardener's cottage, which was moved to Ruggles. And this is Gertrude Vanderbilt's art studio. If you walk the cliff walk, you've probably seen it. The next property is Fairholm on Ruggles. Fairholm has seen a couple of different lives. It began as a stick style house in 1875 when it was designed by Philadelphia architect Frank Furness for Famine Rogers. So you can almost smell the wet paint in this photo. And that's where Fairholm gets its name from Fairman Rogers. The house passed to the Drexel family in the 1890s, and that's when it began its transformation. The Drexels covered up most of the stick style character in brick and shingle. They also added a three-story three tower on the west end. Then in 1909, the Drexels hired Horace Trombard to add a ballroom entertaining. This is a photo of the reconfigured house shows the changes made by the Drexels. And this is a view of Fairholm from the Cliff Walk, sandwiched between Midcliff on the left and Anglesey on the right. A few years later, the house was sold to Count Alfonso Villa. He hired Dwight James Baum to redo the house in a Tudor style. Baum encased the shell in stucco and half timbering and revamped the tower. He essentially created what we now think of as Fairholm. It still exists as a single family home. The next property is the Cliffs. Cliffs was located on Annandale Road, just south of Baxton Lodge. It was built in 1859 by Mason for Daniel Fearing. When Daniel died, the Cliffs passed to his eldest son, Henry. Daniel's other son, George, built the orchard in the same neighborhood. That's the same orchard that we talked about earlier. The Cliffs eventually passed to Henry's nephew, Moses Taylor. Taylor's father, it was H.A.C. Taylor. He had engaged McKim Eden White to build a colonial revival masterpiece on Annandale. The H.A.C. Taylor house was just south of the cliffs. This is a 1930s aerial with ocean lawn in the foreground and the Taylor house in the background. The cliffs is to the right of the Taylor house, but it's concealed by trees, so you really can't see it in this image. Taylor's, Taylor's heirs demolished the cliffs after World War II to save on taxes. Ironically, the HAC Taylor House was demolished a few years after that. The Mason photo shows the back of the Fearing House. Here's a view of the front, but uh, I'd like to turn back to the back of the Fearing House for a moment. If you'd like a sense of what the cliffs must have looked like, check out White Lodge on Bellevue, which was also designed by Mason circa 1863-1864. The uh, closeness has to be more than just coincidence in terms of how these two properties look. Looks like Mason liked the back side of the Fearing House so much that he transformed it into the street side of White Lodge. He then kicked it up a notch with the mansard roof. The next property is Riviera. There's not much written about this handsome Italian villa, which once stood on Halden Ave. It was built in the 1860s by Frederick Diaper for John Ford. It was originally called Bay Terrace. At the time of Mason's book in 1875, it was owned by Judge Hugh Dickey, who called it Riviera. There are a couple of additional images which show its picturesque setting. The house certainly commanded an impressive view of Newport Harbor. Here's a view of Riviera overlooking the harbor. Uh, if you look closely, you can see Ocean House in the background. Riviera was purchased by the Brown family in the early 1900s. They demolished it, hired Ralph Adams Cram to build Harbor Court. And this is now the home of the New York Yacht Club. The next property is the Grove. This house was built before 1875 on Merton Road in a blended second empire stick style. I don't know the architect, but it looks like Mason or Deadly Newton at work time of Mason's book in 1875, it was owned by Mrs. Robert Woodworth, who was 
eventually purchased by James Vandiver Parker. He renamed the house Sans Souci, which is French for without worry. Parker owned the property until his death in 1917. After his death, it was rented by Ogden Codman. It presently exists apartment building. And uh, all of that ornamental stick work is still there and it's very well maintained. The next property is Malbone. Malbone was built in 1848-1849 for Jonathan Prescott Hall by the architect A.J. Davis. Davis was known for its Gothic revival work. The original Malbone was built in the 1740s for Godfrey Malbone. It was destroyed by fire in 1766. You may be familiar with the fire story. It happened uh, during a dinner party. Malbone then ordered that dinner be served outside. He uttered the famous words, by God, if I must lose my house, I shall not lose my dinner. At the time of Mason's book in 1875, it was owned by Henry, Henry Bedlow. Here's the Bedlow family in front of Malbone. Photos probably from the 1870s. Bedlow hired Dudley Newton to renovate the interior. Otherwise, the house hasn't changed much, it still exists as a single family home. The next property is the Thomas Appleton house. It was built by Richard Morris Hunt for his good friend, Thomas Appleton in 1871. The design is stick style. And there's really a lot going on with balconies and dormers and brackets. The exterior was a blend of wood shingle and colored slates and geometric patterns. There's a couple of additional views from the 1890s. The house was significant in its day, so much so that it was the first house depicted in American Architect and Building News. Here's the engraving that was published in 1876. The Appleton House was destroyed by fire around 1920 and the land was added to the adjacent Ayrold House. The Ayrold House was built by Cross and Cross in 1915 and it still stands on Catherine Street. The next property is the Royal Phelps House. This house was designed by an unknown architect before 1850 for the Spooner family. One of two Greek revival houses that were built side by side on Clay Street it has a Greek revival core, but it's had a lot of uh, Victorian embellishments over the years. At the time of Mason's book in 1875, it was owned by Royal Phelps. It still exists as a single family home. Here's a side by side. Phelps house is on the left. Its neighbor is on the right, two different houses, but you can see that the core of the Phelps house is virtually identical to its neighbor. And finally, Mason saved his favorite house for last. This is Woodbine Cottage, Mason's personal home. Uh, Mason gives us an, an interesting introduction to the, uh, the property in his book. He writes, if the proverb holds good, he who drives fat oxen should himself be fat. He who designs cottages for others should have a model cottage of his own and although the subject of the present sketch lays no claim to broad acres, beautiful drives, a sloping lawn, or an extended view, either of the sea or inland, it is no less attractive and may be classed with the picturesque cottages of Newport. Mason built this stick style house in 1873-1874 on the corner of Old Beach and Sunnyside. He chronicled, he chronicled his work on Woodbine in a book called Old House Altered. The book is basically a 19th century version of this old house. This drawing of Woodbine Cottage is taken from Old House Altered. The house is now a bed and breakfast called Architects Inn, appropriate. If you ever want to check it out, be sure to wait until late afternoon. The shadows cast by the ornamental woodwork are pretty spectacular. It's a beautiful house and well worth visiting. So with that, we've completed our survey of 45 properties in Mason's Newport and its cottages. We've lost 19 houses, but 26 houses still stand. I put the DeHoteville house in the, in the lost category because so little remains from the original character of the house. I hope that this project has highlighted for you some of the amazing architecture that we walk by every day and don't always appreciate. I also hope that it's given you a glimpse of some of the architectural treasures that we've lost. We're fortunate to live in a city where preservation is taken seriously, but as we've seen this afternoon, mistakes were made. 
Beechcliff, Stone Villa, Villa Rosa, the list goes on and on. It's important that we remember the mistakes of the past so we don't repeat them. If you have any questions about these 45 properties or any others in Newport, please visit our Facebook group, Newport Lost and Found. It's a fun group. We've got uh, about 5,600 members. The only requirement is a sense of curiosity. I do have a parting gift for everyone who's tuned in tonight. The QR code on the right side of the screen will take you to a digital copy of Newport and its cottages. Just hover your phone over the QR code. It'll take you to the book. But if you run into any problems, don't worry about it. I'll include a uh, link to the digital copy on, uh, on Facebook tonight. So thank you for joining me on this whirlwind tour of Newport 1875. We've covered a lot of ground and uh, it's been somewhat breathless, but we made it. Uh, it's been fun for me. I've learned a lot putting it together and I hope that you've enjoyed it. Thank you so much, Mike. Um, I'm very impressed that you got through all those, those buildings so quickly. <laughs> you did it. Um, we do have time for a couple questions. I see there's already one in the in the Q and A. Um, so if you do have any questions, put them in there, and we'll we'll try and get to them in the time remaining. Um, the first question on there, Mike, is on average how long did it take to build one of these homes? Um, it, it, it's well, I think it depends on the time period, but in terms of houses before 1875, um, I, I've seen an average of two years uh, in terms of dates of construction. Um, probably a function of um, labor and seasonal issues. But uh, yeah, that seems to be the uh, relevant time period, usually about two years. Okay. And then there's another one of oh, this. This one might be a bit technical. Do you know when architects stop using the balloon style framing and are there many homes left with this kind of design? Um, well, I can answer the second portion first, which is yes, there are still lots of balloon framed homes. I own one. Um, which makes me very uh, um, careful when I light a candle because it is, uh, uh, in terms of the way it's constructed, it, it is very flammable. There's uh, essentially a, a chimney that's created at the um, exterior of the house. So it's very easy for a fire to just uh, hatch in one portion and go through the entire house. Uh, balloon framing fell out of favor um, around the turn of the century as uh, different framing techniques um, came into uh, popularity. Um, so as the 1900s uh, wore on, you, you saw less and less of balloon framing. Um, so it really was a, a creature of this uh, narrow period of time. And un unfortunately, um, you know, they, they created these beautiful houses, but they, they were very um, vulnerable to fire, which is why we've lost so many. You, you take a balloon framed house and you put uh, a fireplace in it, which is, um, going 24-7 uh, during the winter and bad things happen, which is why we lost so many. Yeah, um, so this one is, what is your favorite um, extant house? Oh my goodness. Um, well, I'm a big fan of George Champlin Mason as you've uh, probably discovered. So I really do like his, uh, his own home um, at the corner of Sunnyside in Old Beach. Um, and I, I love the fact that the original character of the house is all there. And so Mason um, pulling up to the house and his buggy would recognize it. And, uh, and it, it, it's, it's a house that has um, a, a different character depending on when you approach it. It looks different in the morning um, versus the afternoon. Um, and it really is a time period that I prefer. Um, I, I love houses that were built in the 1870s, which is why I've been drawn to this book. Um, and I know it's somewhat sacrilegious, but in terms of uh, Hunt's work, um, I prefer his earlier work to his Beaux-Arts work, which came later. Um, you know, once the, uh, uh, the Vanderbilts and, uh, and the Astors kind of took hold, um, the, the nature of Newport architecture changed dramatically. And uh, we went from you know, these early Victorian houses that were somewhat simple and they became these grander stone houses that Newport is, is known for today. Uh, it looks like we have time for um, one more. Um, it says, in your pick um, that of the house that predated Ochre Court, it appears that the original home was much closer to the cliff walk. Was that the case? Um, I don't know um, offhand. I need to look at the maps. Um, and there really are an amazing set of maps which go back to 1876, which 
show the uh, configuration of the various properties. Um, and uh, starting in 1876 and every decade or so, there's an update. So we can see the um, changes in the um, um, location and the configuration of these buildings over time. Um, so I'm not sure um, where, where it was located, but uh, curious about that. So I'll, I'll take a peek tonight and I'll post an update on Facebook if, uh, if you don't mind checking that out. All right, again, thank you so much, Mike. And again, I wanna thank um, our sponsor for tonight, uh, Residential Properties and Joseph Costa. Um, be sure to check out um, his website. He's actually got a few of those houses that you mentioned listed. Um, so if you'd like to own a bit of history and if we didn't get to your question, um, you could probably post it on Newport Lost and Found and I'm sure Mike will be able to have the answer for you. Um, thank you so much. Once again, if you're not a member of Newport Historical Society, I highly recommend joining. Um, your membership dues help us put on awesome lectures like this and you get discounts on walking tours and at our museum and shop. So thank you again, thank you for joining and thank you Mike for that excellent talk.